Nuclear stability is nothing more than a measure as to the energy required to overcome that positive positive repulsion of protons, all right? And it's a pretty big amount, all right? Electromagnetic force is nothing to mess around with, and keeping those positive positive forces uh, apart from each other is pretty intense. It's mostly the strong nuclear force, tiny bit of weak maybe, but we're not going to talk about weak too much. Mostly the strong force for our case. <clears throat> strong and weak forces are stronger than electromagnetic force or gravity, and it's mostly the electromagnetic force we have to worry about, keeping those positive positives apart from each other. Nuclear binding energy, which gets the symbol E sub B, is a method that scientists can use to estimate the force contribution, like how much energy does the strong force have to contribute to keep the nucleus safe. And that's a kind of calculation we're going to do here in a little bit, which is really pretty cool. There's some interesting uh, applications of the nuclear binding energy values we're going to see. And uh, yeah, so get ready, hang on. But anyway, what we're going to look at here is how to calculate the nuclear binding energy. The nuclear binding energy, E sub B, is the negative of the energy change if the nucleus is formed directly from individual protons and neutrons. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do an example of this EB calculation. And let's say it was for a helium nucleus, a helium-4. Well, helium-4 comes from two protons and two neutrons. So we're basically going to do a delta E, an energy change for that reaction. All right, two protons plus two, two neutrons making a helium-4. And whatever number we get, we're going to take the negative, the opposite of it. So binding energies will turn out to be positive numbers. And if all of that was as clear as mud, well, let's get into an example and I'll show you what I mean here. Let's calculate the binding energy for making deuterium. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. It's hydrogen 2. Deuterium is sometimes referred to as heavy hydrogen. But anyway, in this process, you would take then one proton and one neutron, add them together to make hydrogen 2. And you can see this is a balanced reaction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the protons plus the neutrons making the atom is what you want to do for these binding energy calculations. Well, you can actually figure out the masses of the proton, neutron, and deuterium. Um, deuterium has been studied a lot, and the mass of the deuterium is 2.01410. Um, since Chem 221, we have had mass values for protons and neutrons. The neutron is a little bit heavier than the protons, 1.008 versus 1.007, etc. But an interesting thing happens here. If you add Add up the proton and neutron mass and you compare it to the deuterium, whoops, we've got a problem because 2.016475 is certainly bigger than 2.01410, i.e. the mass we put in is not equal to the mass we get out. And as a chemist, that's like burr, burr, red alert time, sound effects not necessary, all right, but wow, mass not, go, not equaling the mass that comes out. Out, this is like breaking all the law of mass action kind of things that we talked about uh, in balancing chemical equations and stuff like that. And that's kind of trippy. So the mass is not conserved. You're actually losing mass on going from a proton and a neutron to the deuterium. You have a negative delta M. Remember, delta is always final minus initial. So final 2.01410 minus initial 2.016475, you get this negative number. And again, you might be thinking, oh, Russell, you made me go through all those balancing chemical reaction things back in Chem 221, and maybe it wasn't that important? Oh, it is important. There's something else going on here. Because if you think about it, for some reason, a proton and a neutron must make deuterium. And what is that reason? Well, thank the stars, Einstein came around. Woohoo! And Einstein, one of his famous equations is E equals mc squared. And in this problem, we're going to talk about the change in energy, delta E, equaling the change in mass, delta m, times c squared. 
Now, we need our energy to be in joules, and a joule is a kilogram meters squared per second squared when you break the units down. This is something in the SI units we talked about quickly in Chem 221. So what that means is our delta M in grams per mole, we have to turn into kilograms per mole. So notice that 0 0.00239, when you divide by 1,000, becomes negative 2.39 times 10 to the minus 6, all right? So you need to turn grams per mole into kilograms per mole. But if you do that, you can then multiply by the speed of light squared. The speed of light we talked about in Chem 221 as well. It's 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So if you square the speed of light and you multiply it by the kilograms per mole, you're going to get an energy, an energy which is in joules per mole. Now let's just stop there for a second. Delta E negative 2.15 times 10 to the 11th joules per mole. And that would be negative 2.15 times 10 to the 8th kilojoules per mole. That number is massive compared to the types of delta E's we've looked at since the thermodynamic chapter in Chem 221. I mean, you know, acids plus bases, we maybe get like 10 to the 3rd kilojoules per mole or combustion reactions we looked at sometimes in Hess's law. Or, or even recently when we did energy transitions of taking like ice and turning it into gas, water, or something like that. Even those were, you know, 10 to the third, fourth kilojoules, nothing too big. This is a big, big amount of energy. And this negative energy is basically the reason why elements form from raw protons and neutrons at all. It is the price, the money you get out for making these isotopes. And it's huge. All right. Generally speaking, exothermic reactions are the ones that happen. And because this is exothermic, i.e. negative, and it's freaking large, just a huge number, this is why atoms form. Binding energy equals the negative of the delta E. So in this value, when I turned the E sub B, first of all, I went joules per kilojoules, which means I divided by a thousand, and I also turned my negative into a positive number. Bonding and en binding energy is the energy required to keep the nucleus stable. I want to backtrack just a little bit. The delta E was massively negative, massively exothermic, and that really is a justification for why atoms form. If there wasn't a reason for atoms to form, we would have just random assortments of protons, neutrons, and electrons floating around the universe, i.e. carbon and DNA and caffeine. Woo -hoo! These kind of things would never form, all right? So a huge delta E like that, a huge negative delta E, is just justification for why the atoms form. And oh yeah, they want to form, all right? As the delta E becomes more negative, you have more likelihood of the atoms forming. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. But binding energy is always the opposite of the delta E. So you take the positive version. I turned the joules per moles into kilojoules just because that's what people usually do. Uh, pretty cool. The binding energy here, the very positive, just means that you have lots of energy staved through the stabilization through making the atom. All right, and that's kind of cool to know too. Binding energies, a lot of times they'll talk about binding energy per nucleon. And a nucleon is just a particle in the nucleus. So in this example, we had one proton plus one neutron or two nucleons. So if you take that 2.15 times 10 to the eighth, and you divide by two, that's going to give you the kilojoules per mole of nucleons. And that's the amount that people feel is what the strong force contributes to keep the atom stable. So without that kind of energy, you wouldn't be able to form the uh, atom at all, the heavy hydrogen, because the protons would try and stay away from each other. Now, again, this is hydrogen, so you'd only have one proton. You might be able to squish that number a little bit, but still, it's pretty massive, strong force force, definitely pretty important. Scientists have collected binding energies for nuclei for a whole bunch of different processes. And you can see down here in the lower left, here is deuterium, heavy hydrogen. And the value 1.08 times 10 to the eighth, whatever it was on the last slide, you can see it's about right there. So that's pretty cool. And that's a heavy hydrogen. However, they've done this for all the different isotopes on the periodic table. And you can see there's all kinds of different numbers on there. 
If you look at that table long enough, and again, there it is again, you'll see that iron 56, which is right there, that's the top of the curve, all right? And people consider iron 56 to be the most stable element thermodynamically. And we see this kind of stuff. If you know about astronomy, a lot of times when the suns go nova or supernova, a lot of times iron 56 is like the end, like it can't make any more energy. And that's when the sun begins to break down. So even the power of the sun is unable to make uh, more than iron 56. So if you look at that binding energy curve, there's a bunch of atoms less than iron, which are getting more like iron, but there's also a lot of elements and atoms that have heavier masses that also want to be like iron. So iron literally is the end of the cycle. Once things create iron, the atoms kind of stop. There's no more processes that are going to happen. So iron Atoms that have less than 26 protons, that are less than irons, they're going to use a process called fusion to become more like iron 56. On the other hand, the atoms with more than 26 protons, i.e. greater than iron, will undergo fission to become more like iron 56. But I want you to think about this a little bit. All of the carbon in our bodies and the oxygen we breathe and the hydrogens and the magnesiums and the nickels and everything everything else. They all want to be like iron 56. And so do the heavier ones, uraniums and leads and tins and things like this. They all want to be like iron 56. So one day, if the universe becomes essentially all iron 56, that's it. That is thermodynamically the end of everything. Because once you get to the more stable place, there's no more energy out. There's no more making future elements. And on one level, that's kind of freaky because yeah, once you get to iron 56, the universe stops, game over, <laughs> all right? Fortunately though, good old kinetics, the study of speeds of reactions comes to help us out here a lot. Making iron 56 from carbon or deuterium or whatever is incredibly slow. It has a massive energy of activation that has to be overcome in order for the iron 56 to happen. These elements don't just naturally turn into iron 56. It's a pretty high energy process we're going to see. And so because the energies of activations of these reactions are so slow, none of us have to worry about the universe becoming iron 56 and game over like I just prophesized earlier. No way. The energies of activation are just massive, way off the scale for human things. So no one has to worry about iron 56 becoming the only element in the universe, although that might make a cool science fiction story, but I digress. I think my prophet fell off. Um, just realize kinetics is kind of the helper here. So just like kinetics uh, is going to prevent anyone from having to sell their diamonds because diamonds will all go to graphite one day, the energies of activation are huge. So no one has to worry about all your diamonds decomposing to graphite. No one has to worry about hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, etc. turning into iron 56 anytime in the near future. All right. The energies of activation are just so massive that the reactions are super slow. Almost no atoms have enough energy to overcome it. It is kind of a cool thing to think about, though, if you're a thermodynamic scientist. This is the kind of question you might see. It says, which of the following nuclei has the highest binding energy per nucleon? And there are four atoms listed, and a fifth says none of the above. Well, if you happen to be able to look up or you have a table of binding energies per nucleon, you can look these four up and see which one has the highest binding energy per nucleon, stuff like that, which is totally cool. However, if you don't have a table of binding energies per nucleon next to you, what, you don't have one next to you all the time? Just joking. I don't have one either. Anyway, what you can do is you can look and think about which of those atoms is closest to iron 56 because iron 56 is the thermodynamic endpoint for this kind of discussion. So helium and lithium, A and C, are definitely much lower than iron on uh, atomic numbers. Thorium is much higher than iron. But nickel, all right, answer B, nickel is pretty close to iron. So if you look up the values for the binding energy, 
energies here. The nickel is definitely going to be the closest one. It has the highest binding energy per nucleon because it's closest to iron. So that's a nice way to kind of guesstimate on these things. And if you look it up, you'll see that's the answer too.